Well, that's a good song, Wayne. That was a good one. How do you guys feel about that? He's great. He's a great guy. Do, do, has he done something for you that you can look at and say, I know. I know that I know that I know that was him. It doesn't have to be big. Mm-hmm. It just has to be really important. That's good. I hear two big things. Because he made statements like, you know, I did a lot of great things on the earth. But he said, I want you to do greater things. So just take a little time to cruise through the Gospels and find out what he did. And compare yourself up. I don't know if he built any houses. But I can tell you he didn't do 915. There's things that he wants you to do. My job here is to not do it. God didn't call me to do it for you. He called me to teach you how to do it. It can get scary. Sometimes you really feel empty inside. Sometimes you feel like he's alone long, long way off. Like, where are you? I mean, I'm in trouble. I need some help. I've been there every single time that I've seen a miracle performed. So if you ain't there, you're not heading for a miracle. Sorry. You can live in your la-la land all you want. But if you aren't in a position where you just don't understand, you don't get it. Mm -hmm. It may be painful. It may be a great struggle. again. God's moving me on. You guys know what it's like to be chastened? Chastened? Mm-hmm. Chastened. Oh, chastened. Chastened. Gotcha. Do you know what it's like to be chastened? Did your daddy ever spank you? Do you know if he didn't, he doesn't love you? What the Bible says. He said, You're illegitimate children. In the world, you put that in your pipe and smoke it. True. <laughs> Chastening means to correct by punishment. To punish, to inflict pain for the purpose of reclaiming an offender. He's just trying to straighten you out. Now, he may not know all of it. He may not understand it all. But you know what he was doing? What was your dad doing? Mark? The best he could. Hear it? So before you start judging your dad or saying something negative about him, if you had that experience with him and he disciplined you, you need to get on your knees tonight and thank God for that dad. You know, there's a lot of kids who don't have a dad. A lot of them are born without a dad. 
They'd lost that part of their life growing up. But the beauty of it is, when you get old enough, you get the real dad. If you'll surrender to him. He's called a heavenly father. And guess what he's going to do? Sorry, guys. Sorry. You're going to go through some rough times. But those times are not there to hurt you. Those times are there to build you up, to encourage you, to strengthen you, to give you direction, to give you guidance. To give you hope. to give you a future. Because without it, you're going to get off on the wrong path. There's death out there. There's failure out there. There's going the wrong way. There's all kinds of, there's all kinds of struggle, and there's all kinds of pitfalls, and there's all kinds of other things that will take you down. It's called the devil that comes to kill, steal, destroy. And God says, chastening is to purify from errors and faults to afflict by other means. This is what he says. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Now, you didn't understand about that, your dad. You just, you know what you did? You got spanked and made you mad. And you went to your friends and you did what? Talked about the old man? The jerk? And then he tells you no because you can't have that new bicycle. Well, yeah, you know, he don't love me. I mean, he just beat the daylight out of me yesterday and now he tells me I can't have a bike. All the crap goes on in your life. And then when you get into the kingdom of God, maybe you get born again. You treat the Heavenly Father the same way. You just don't understand all these problems I got. And why doesn't everybody else have these problems? Look at the problems I got. Oh my gosh, everything seems to be failing around me and nothing seems to work. And every time I want to go a certain way, it fails. And I fall into a pit. I get off the road. Things fall apart for me and I just can't seem to make it. And you develop that as your norm. That becomes your normal. And you know what you do? You seek out churches that believe that. And all you said around in your pity parties, and guess what? None of you ever go anywhere. Pastor got the same problem. You got the same problem. Everybody in the congregation has got the same problem. And if anybody comes there through something a little different, guess what you do to him? He either goes down or he leaves. That's why this is different. God told me don't sweat small beginnings. You know, I'm reading about Joe Osteen today, just a little thing and he did one thing one thing on the on the YouTube he had seven million followers you know my first reaction was I'm done I quit <laughs> this ain't working dear me I'm preaching faith and I'm preaching believing and you know preaching to stand up for something and believe for something and get out there and get your rear end going and make something happen in life quit screwing around and digging around with all this nothingness I know it doesn't look I know it looks impossible I know you don't have the money I know you can't get it done I know you don't have an education I know you don't work most of the time for most of the people I know all about the can'ts And if you're comfortable, you're not doing enough. 
What do you think I did five years ago when I decided I'm going to start writing a letter every day? They? Are you out of your mind? I have ministries told me, they said, how do you do it? I said, I have no idea, but the Holy Spirit directs me. I just did a posting yesterday, and I talked about it a little bit, and I said, I don't, I, I'll, 90% of the time, I'll sit down and have no clue what I'm going to say. And I just put my hand on the typewriter and start moving it, and next thing you know, I get an idea. How'd you like to live that way every day? Man, I love to have just 49,000 ideas in my brain, and I sit down, and I'll just start with one and just, just type it all out. That'd be wonderful. But it don't work that way. That's not how it works. If you want to walk in faith and you want to do something by faith, you're going to do things that you can't understand and it looks scary and you can't figure it out. Because if you can, it's not God. If you can get it to work, it's not God. But if it's bigger than you are and it's impossible to get there, and you don't have any way of knowing how it's going to happen, and I don't know how it's going to finance this, I don't know how it's going to work, now you're starting to tap into God. What do you need Him for if you, know, if you can do it? What do you need God for if you can do it? See, that's what I appreciate about Donald Trump. He looked at the swamp. He looked at the problems. Mm -hmm. He'd never done anything like that before. But he'd been there before. He took and did things that were bigger than he was. What, do you think he had the money for a skyscraper? He learned how to do it in the little things. Out there in the, you know what Donald Trump was doing? He was out in the sheepfold for 30 years with his little stones and his little slingshot, and he's learned how to kill the lion and the bear, the bird, the squirrel, the wildcat. But one day, God said, Today, young man, you're 71 years old, and it's time for Goliath. That's what happened to him. That's what the Lord told me. Because I understand that. And I see it here. Not here. I see it here. Proverbs 20, 13, 24. Those who spare the rod of discipline hate their children. Sorry. That's what it says. Those who love their children care enough to discipline them early and often and promptly. probably told you guys this story before. And I had a son that when he's in the fourth grade and it was my practice to always have my prayer time with my children at night. What was the key word I just said? Thank you. That was my practice. That wasn't my once in a while. That was my practice. It wasn't my perfection. It was my practice. I was practicing. How do you get good in a sport? How do you get good as a father? It was my practice to always spend time with my children at night. 
Oh, I, I had a battle. Sometimes you have a battle with your wife. Sometimes you have a battle with your children. I'm not going to get into it tonight, but unless I misunderstand this Bible, the Bible says you are the head of your house. Nowhere, you can't find anywhere in there that the Bible says the wife is. It says the husband is. Head of the house. You know, if you don't have a head of the house, the house ain't going to function real well, is it? You got to have a head. Or it don't work. So my practice was to sit down in front of him and talk to him. Well, I could see one of my, one of my sons was having a problem. You know what happens when you learn to practice? You, you begin to learn things, don't you? If you played sports, you know you start learning things when you're playing. You, you know what you're getting? Experience. Add to your experience. That's what God says. Keep adding to it. And guess what it turns into? Epigenosis. I taught you guys about epigenosis. It's super knowledge. Not knowledge. Super knowledge. So the more you practice, the more you discern. So all the things you guys said are part of it, but it's about developing the epigenosis of your life. When you begin to really get a super knowledge of that thing that you're doing. It's what you have to develop if you're going to succeed, if you're going to move forward, if you're going to get away from that, I reached this level and I got very comfortable. I don't want to be there. That's why I took on this teaching and that's why I started this class. I could have lived, I could have done anything I want. But my question was, Lord, what do you want? What do you want from me? Do you ask him that every day? Lord, what do you want from me? Do you return to him? Oh, I'm just really comfortable. I just don't want to do that. Not a problem. He'll never stop loving you. Ever. But you're done. You're not going any farther. And if you never do another thing in faith, He'll still love you because he can't deny himself. He'll still love you. But if you don't know how to step out in faith and keep moving in faith and move from faith to faith, at some point in time you're done. You know, I got this, I got this building next door. Two things did very quickly and then the other two... Rooms did not. And the Lord began to talk to me about it. Well, you know, have I got any less in my walk of faith than you do? Maybe my zeros are a little different, but it's exactly the same thing. I'm stretching myself. What, what, what do you think the squirrels are paying for that? Who do you think's paying for that? Who thinks coming up with two hundred and seventy seventy thousand dollars to do that? I'm walking in faith. That's what I'm doing. So I just keep moving. You know what it is? It's an opportunity. I did a teaching years ago. Opportunity. What are you doing with it? When the nation Israel was standing at the Jordan River, they'd come out of Egypt, they went through the Red Sea, now they're standing at the Jordan River. What is that? It's an opportunity. And there's always an obstacle and an opportunity. Always. There's always something that won't work. 
There's always something that won't happen. There's always something that your eyes will deceive you on, that your ears will confuse you on, and that your brain will short circuit. Always. Not sometimes, always. And that's what was happening to them. They were short-circuiting, and instead of looking at what God had already done with the idea that if he did that, surely he'll do this. But you know what their attitude was? Why did you bring us out here? There's giants over there. That's different than that water we just went through. But each step was different. But it's still, it's still God. They had an opportunity. Are you listening to me? Every single one of you here has an opportunity right now that's in front of you. It may not be scary yet because you haven't decided to do it. But when you decide to do that opportunity, that's when it starts getting scary because you make a commitment and you start moving into it. And it, that's when it starts getting scary because that's when it starts getting real. It's not real when it's just in your brain. You know what it is? It's a figment of your imagination. That's all it is. It's nothing. It's zero. It's zilch. Nada. Because you don't... A figment of your imagination is nothing. How many people do you know had ideas in their life and gave up on them, quit them? You know, why did they do it? What did you say, Wayno? I remember I was talking to the Lord about this about 25 years ago. And I said, man, God, it seemed like every time I step out in faith, it's the same thing. I got to knock the stupid wall down. Man, wouldn't you just one time give me a way of climbing over it? He doesn't answer me. When you get stupid with him, he just goes silent. Because the Bible says you don't ever answer a fool in his folly. Do you think he's going to violate that? He's the one who wrote it. He gave it to you. You got somebody trying to discourage you? He's a fool. He may be the greatest guy in the universe. But that don't mean he's not a fool. He'd be a senator, a congressman, your best friend, your, your mom, your dad, your aunt, your uncle, your, your multimillionaire cousin. But if they're standing in the way or what you feel God's spoken to you about, they're your obstacle. Because you've got to get through that first. You've got to get through the people first. Because they're always the one standing there in your face. The actual obstacle can speak to you, but it usually comes through people. And they'll give you all the reasons why it's stupid. Why it won't work. Can't happen. You're in a fool's errand. What are you doing that for? Why would anybody do that? You're comfortable. You got money coming in. You got things okay. You're comfortable. Why would you do such a stupid thing? And those people that have credibility with you are usually the ones that talk to you like that. Because you know, if you got a man that's a stark raving enemy, and he come up and told you that, would you believe him? You ain't going to believe him. He's your enemy. He's always been your enemy. He's an enemy in your mind. You don't care what he says. But if somebody comes up to you that loves you, and they say that, now it's got some teeth to it, don't it? There's some real grit there. Yeah. That's pretty tough. How many people, I want to ask you, 
How many times did you hear something on the television, intellectual, something medical? You take this pill and it'll get rid of your zippity doo da and your, you know, and every kind of a problem and, you know, and you this problem and that problem and fix this and fix that. And if you got this symptom, you better get to the doctor because you got this thing going on and that thing going on. My gosh, you could die and your feet could fall off your body and your, your eyes could ball, fall out of their he your head and my goodness, your ears could fall down. I mean, there's always something that's trying to steal from you something that God said. When I get... Well, if I'm watching something on television and they bring one of the medicine commercials on, which is about every other one now, first of all, if it happens a couple of times, click, I'm done. That program isn't worth two hoots to me because I don't want to hear the garbage because that's how the devil works. He hides very subtly behind things you kind of like, but then you got to take the garbage. My Bible says, guard your eyes, guard your ears, for out of the heart comes all the issues of life. So if you're believing for a healing, don't watch the garbage. But if it says it, I always say, Jesus bore my sickness and carried my disease, and by his stripes I'm healed. I refuse to let that thing being said be the last thing that I hear. I, I, I don't want it. Because if it's contrary to what the Word of God says, then I don't want it. And I refute it. And I speak to it. Because my Bible says, whatsoever things you desire, when you pray, believe that you receive, and you shall have whatsoever you say, you desire. For whosoever shall say unto this mountain, be thou plucked up and cast a sea. And don't doubt in his heart, but believe that what he says will come to pass. You have whatever he says. If you listen to it, you eventually start saying it. Because if you listen to it, you've allowed it through your ear gate. And you've allowed the gate of your city to get weakened. The devil works in a Trojan horse. Looks like he's really a good guy. Go home and take these pills. I diagnosed that you have a heart problem. It's a heart murmur. Could die. Go home and take these pills. So you grab them. What did you just do? You've allowed the Trojan horse to get inside your gate. And he doesn't mean any good in there. There's no good in the deception. There's no good in something being said to you that contradicts what the Word of God says. The key is, do you believe? What do you believe? This is what we're talking about, believing. What's other things you desire? Seed. When you pray, planting, believe, growing season, that you receive harvest time, full ear, full stock, and you shall have in the barn. We're in the believing. Let's finish up a little bit here. I'll... I'll, I'll uh, I'll get this cleaned up a little bit on the chastening. Now no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. Nevertheless, after it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it, it yields righteousness. It yields what is righteous. Right with God. 
Righteous. The Word of God. What is righteous? The Word of God is righteous. It's perfect. It's right. It's right. And so discipline yields righteousness, rightness. It'll cause you to kind of start to cut away the crap. You cut the barnacles off your ship so that your ship runs a little smoother. And the more you cut off, the better it runs. The more prosperous you become. The more you think like God. And as you begin to think like God, your results become like God. When you take this word and you hide it in your heart, see, we, we, it says in Proverbs, thy word have I hid in my heart that I might sin against thee. Well, what we've taken that as, well, I won't, you know, I won't commit adultery and I won't murder and I won't cheat and steal. Well, my Bible says whatsoever is not of faith is sin. See, all that other stuff has been handled. Think commandments aren't your problem. You understand? Yeah. The Ten Commandments were not given to give you a righteous life. They were given to you to show you how imperfect you were. Mm -hmm. So that's being preached in so many churches because it dumbs people down and it puts them under judgment. And that feels good to some church leaders. But the Ten Commandments is not for that purpose. God wants us to know that you are righteous. You're not trying to get there. You're not trying to make it. You're not trying to be good enough. He said all of your righteousness is filthy rags. I want you to have mine. Take it. And when you receive the Holy Spirit, you receive His righteousness. And then we spend a lot of our time after that trying to get the condemnation out. Because the law is so real to you, it's still in your mind. And he wants you to renew your mind and prove what that good and acceptable and perfect will of God is. He wants you to be renewing your mind constantly, driving out the condemnation. And let me tell you something. As long as you are in condemnation for something that was in your past or even something that's now, as long as you're letting condemnation dictate to you, you will never, ever step out in faith for anything because you are never going to be good enough for God to help you. Because every day, every night, you look in the mirror and you realize how imperfect you are. And God says, I don't want you to do that. I don't want you to think that way anymore. I want you to know I've become your righteousness. Old things have passed away. All things have become new. I want you to know that. Now, we talk about that when people get people born again. But they don't, they don't use that scripture when it comes to living the Christian life. They get you born again that way, but then but after that, then you're constantly repenting and constantly, you know, you're constantly condemned, being condemned and you're always making, making a, a judgment of yourself. Sometimes that moves into judgment of others. But the judgment of yourself is damaging. You never can have confidence when you do that. Have you ever guys watched a sports game, maybe basketball or I guess I, I, I guess I see it in basketball more than anything else because it's kind of like the sport that I understand a little bit better than anything else, although I played football and baseball. But I've watched, I've watched these teams playing, and this team's down by 20 points. Something happens, and they start rallying. The next thing you know, they're up by 10 points. What happened there? Was it talent? And nothing to do with talent. Was it coaching? 
What was it? Confidence. That starts with attitude. But when you get confidence, if you have confidence before the Lord, then you know you have the petitions that you ask of Him. Mm-hmm. If you are under judgment in your heart, you are in sin. Because you are violating the yeah. very thing that God told you you weren't. You're not in faith. You understand? Whatsoever is not a faith is sin. So what you do is you've got to look in the mirror and say, that is a great man. You're going to do great things. Everything you put your hands to, the Father is going to bless it. Everything you think about is going to turn to gold. Everywhere you go, you're going to prosper and be in health. Everything I think about during the day is going to be a stepping stone to my great future. Now you start talking like that, instead of, you don't ever amount to anything. My guys, just look at the mess we went through today. Everything seemed to not work right and everything seemed to fail. I thought, I know what it is. It's just God's not on my side because I'm the stinking low, low down dirty dog. I know I'm a stinking low down dirty dog because I didn't look at my life. Just look at it. It's a disaster. All I got to do is turn around like this and say, look at it. <laughs> what did I teach you last week? Don't do this. That's not advancement. You got to quit looking back. You got to start looking inside and say, thank God for my future. What did you say, Mark? Hope. Now they're talking about hope here. That's a real deal. That's a God thing, that's a God principle. And hope deferred makes the heart sick. That's what it says. You know what's happened to most Christians? And in most cases, John, they've given up on it. And they decided, whatever it is I'm at, whatever level I'm at, that's just what God has designed for me. And God's sitting there saying, my gosh, all you have to do is walk and talk like me, and there's going to be nothing impossible. There's nothing impossible, the word says, to him who what? Believes. Oh, really? It says that? Yeah. It really does? Yeah. Oh, my God. It, Really? I would surely think all things are possible to him is good enough. That's what the devil tells you. You're not good enough. That's why you got the, you know, the, you know all those struggles you're going through right now? That's because you're not good enough. So just give up. Quit. You're in a fool's errand. You're never going to make it. You didn't grow up in the right family. You ever been told that? Joey? You ever been told that? Didn't grow up in the right family, don't have the right education, didn't get this right, didn't get that right. I just look at my life and I know there's things back there. Just look at it. I don't see anything back in my back that speaks of what Doyle's talking about. Yes, that's right. <laughs> there's nothing in your past that will relate to what I'm talking about. But you aren't looking back there anymore. That's gone. That's gone. Forever. The only thing you got ahead of you is today and your future. And what are you going to do with it? What are you going to do about it? I don't care if you're capable. I don't care if you're talented. I don't care about any of that. 
I don't care if the devil's convinced you, you're just stupid. That's why nothing works for you. He's told that to a few people. I'd say everybody in the room. He's got a pretty good track record. And some of you have done okay, and some of you think, well, you know, I'm just luck of the draw. Some of us get lucky. I've had guys tell me, oh, you're just old lucky. I said, really? I said, you tell me I'm of the devil? He said, well, I'd say that. I said, well, that's what lucky means. It's a derivative of Lucifer. So you guys go ahead and keep using that word. Help yourself. Because you're being deceived up to your eyeballs. Because that's what it says. You just got lucky. Well, you got lucky with this. Well, we did this. We left it. They're just lucky. That guy, he's got money because he's lucky. The devil uses that to keep you in bondage. He doesn't want you to get ahead. And how he stops it is what you got in your brain. Because God did something in your spirit. So everything I'm talking about, if you're born again, is already there. Your finances, your health, your wealth, your wisdom, your knowledge, your understanding. It's there. It's called Jesus Christ. Christ in you is your hope of glory. What glory is he talking about? When you get to heaven? What's the point? When you're there, you can't do nothing else here. You're done. And this is where everything happens. And I always looked at it and said, you know, eternity is a long time. I got eternity to go up there. So what am I going to get done here? I may as well stay here 120 years, and I'll just get everything done that I can. Why, why, why not look at it that way? Why not believe? The only problem is we don't believe. That's the thing that keeps that thing inside of you from coming out of your life and out of your hands and out of your feet and out of your eyes and out of your ears and out of your tongue because the power of life and death is in your tongue. I did say the power of life, didn't I? That power is there to keep you walking in a way that brings glory to God. Christ in you, the hope of glory to God because of what he did for you and you and why your walk of faith and by the things that you do, you bring glory to him. You guys want to talk about money and wealth and all that stuff? There's only one reason why you're supposed to have it. If you think it's to drive a Mercedes and fly a jet, you're screwed, you and tattooed. You just missed the way. You just lost your way. God says, I want to bless you to be a blessing. And he lets you keep some of it. I keep some of it. I do. Enjoy anything I want. I don't do some things. Because I don't feel led to do it. This spring I wanted to buy a really, really, I'm going to give you a Cousin Eddie. You know what Cousin Eddie is? National Lampoon's Christmas Holiday. You ever heard of it? I'm going to give you something that's real nice, Clark. Real nice. I had some money I wanted to spend and buy a really nice sports car. I mean real nice. 
So just in your little brain, think of something ten times bigger than what you're thinking. I have the money. And the Lord says, I want you to give that away. You know what I did the next day? I gave it away. I just want to be a steward of the kingdom. I want to be a blessing so that God will trust me with more. Now that takes some faith, don't it? Because it's gone. When I wrote the check and I put it in the mail, it was gone. Does that take some faith, Caleb? Gone. So when you sit there and you're real comfortable, you know what you're going to do? You're going to lose it. You're going to make a really stupid decision, and you're going to lose it. I talk to people about the wealthy people, and they say, you can't believe their lives. Most of them are just a total disaster. So if you got a half a billion dollars, and your family's falling apart, what do you got? You're miserable in your mind. I've had men tell me, I would spend everything I got to fix that situation. Everything. And those that don't, they lose even more. Because this word here, it works for whosoever. Who so Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. So I said, I don't want that pride. I don't want to be driving down the street and have somebody go, Woo, look at him, man, that's a fire looking machine. And I sat up in my seat and go, ain't I something? I mean, I am really something. Guess what I just did? That was my reward. You know what it's worth? What, what this little circle of paint right here is worth? <laughs> worth nothing. That's why God told you when you give, keep your mouth shut. You want to talk about it? That's your reward. You're done. Done. Because you've got your reward. You built yourself up. As a teacher, I have a different obligation. So I tell a lot of my testimonies and a lot of things I've done. But I don't talk about what I'm going to do. Mm -hmm. I talk about my testimony. To encourage, exhort, train, instruct, build up, encourage. That's what I do it for. I'm going to read this again. Now no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. Nevertheless, afterward it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Hebrews 12, 8. But if you are without chastening, of which all have become partakers then you are illegitimate bastards. That's not a real good word, is it? When I was a kid, I got my mouth washed out with soap. And I've, been, I've had it before. And it ain't fun. Because it's hard to get the soap out of your teeth. You are illegitimate bastards, and you're not sons at all. 
Hebrews 12, 7, King James. If you endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the father chasteneth not? Question mark. You're not a son. If you spare the rod, you spoil the child. I didn't say you knock your kids out. And I didn't say you leave them out in the cold for four hours to, just to train them, teach them something. I'm not talking about stupid things. I'm talking about very simply disciplining them. I'm not talking about do it when you're angry. There's times when I've had to walk away. It was a discipline in me that I had to walk away. And I would tell them, I'm walking away. And I walked away until I got myself cooled down. I thought about it. I figured it. People say, that's cold and calculating. I said, no, it's obedience to the word. So it's not cold, it's not cold and calculating if I'm really angry and I hit, hit the kid and I hurt him. That's, that, that's, not, that's not cold. No, that's stupid. I'm talking about you do it because the Lord asks you to. Not because you understand it. Now, I hear parents all the time, oh, my kids, they just listen. I don't ever have to discipline them. They just listen to whatever I tell them. I'm going, what are you, what are you raising a robot? That's like violation of the word. That's like the, the kids are perfect. There's no way. Everybody has it to deal with. You need to find that level. That's a big deal. And I'm telling you this because those hardships you're going through, that's the chastening of the Lord. I've told you before, I sat on three condominiums and two houses in my subdivision for 10 years. What was going on with Steve Doyle? I'm a pretty slow earner. But I learned it. And he blessed me. You have to understand, I must have been pretty blessed before that. Because that's just five houses and they're all sitting there and they're all paid for. But you know what? The devil told me a thousand times, maybe 10,000, you're never going to sell. Nobody wants to live here. Nobody in Lima is going to pay that kind of money. They're going to buy that cheap stuff. And that's not what I built. And I said, well, I'm not going to compromise. I'm not going to compromise what I believe and what I want and I'm not going to start building junk so I kept up what I believed in and to this day 47 years later I've never compromised and God has always always blessed me he has always honored my walk of faith but the chastening is not pleasant Burns it off of you. Burns the garbage out. And you know what you end up doing if your heart's right? If you stay in the Word and don't start getting bitter toward God and then you give up? I mean, I can't tell you how many of my friends just gave up and filed bankruptcy and then didn't believe God for nothing anymore. They were done. They never believed Him for anything. They just filed bankruptcy and that was the end of it. They were fearful of doing it again because how am I going to do it? I fell, I went bankrupt the last time and nothing happened and I couldn't get it sold and I couldn't make it happen. Not me. 
I stood for 10 years. You know how many times I could have given it away? You know how many times I could have failed? Do you know how many times I could have quit and just said, forget it all? About three times a day for 10 years. You do the math. At, at least an hour in the morning when I first woke up and I'm trying to get the... Get myself woke up and the only thing that's coming to my head is how are you going to do what are you going to do now what are you, how are you going to ever make this work what are you going to do now I mean the, the city of Lima is a, the most oppressed city in the United States what are you going to do now that, that's what I woke up to what are you going to do now how are you going to make that work had I not been in the word of God I've been gone if I could challenge you guys, you get in that book and you read that thing. You don't get nothing today, read it tomorrow. Read it tonight. Read it again. Read it over again. Read it from a different version. Just keep doing it. Bam! The light will come on. And revelation will come. And that's your power. Without it, there's nothing but a bunch of words on a page. You can take this book out and burn it. Because it's not valuable to God at all. But if you get what's in here. And get it in here. And get this renewed. It becomes the manual of life. For most people. It's a doorstop. Or it holds up one end of the coffee table. Maybe you put your coffee on it. That's what it is. But see, I made a decision. I'm going to read this. I didn't run from God when I had my issue. I ran to him. Because I realized this is just a trial. It's a short and momentary affliction. Does 10 years seem like a long time to you? It did to me. But God told me, he says, it's a short and momentary affliction. He said, the things that I'm going to teach you in those 10 years, you'll make it up 50-fold. So okay. That's why I just choose to believe. You can come and tell me something else, but you, I'm not going to believe it. So I didn't have a lot of friends. Not too many people like to come around a guy like me. Because I just call horse a horse. And you know what? They want, they want you to hold their hand and tell them, tell them uh, I, love, I told you guys last week, this, I was listening to this guy talking on the YouTube, and, and he lost his audience. He's a preacher. And he lost his audience. He said, well, I guess I'll start talking about Noah's Ark and all the warm and fuzzy animals. Because people want the warm and fuzzy, you know. Don't do nothing for you. But feels good. Flesh is satisfied for a moment. And then you're back into reality again. Because at some, some point that day, you're going to look in the mirror and you're going to realize nothing's changed. And all the little things that you try and do. You take this pill for this situation. Or you, or, you, or you go borrow money at a bank. Or you put money on a credit card you shouldn't be doing. And you know what? It's a momentary fix. But the poison comes tomorrow. If I heard it right. The average American has... Something like $26,000 on a credit card. You know, I, I've, never, I've never paid a credit card payment. I'm not, back up. I've never paid credit card interest. I got too many guys here and no better than that. So. I've never paid any. Not... Not knowingly. In other words, if I missed something or something happened or whatever. But I always got it back. I would call them and say, hey, I'm not going to pay this. They said, not a problem. We'll take it off. I said, you can look at my record. I always pay ahead of time. And they say, yep, Mr. Doyle, one of my credit cards I've had since 19, 
89. Said, record's clean. Nothing on it. How many years is that? 31. Well, this is just a little side journey on our believing, but it is a part of it. Because the chastening is so important to understand. If you think you're going to get into something and it's just going to fall off a log, what falls off the log is you. There's nothing easy except reading this book. This is really easy. Believing it is difficult because everything in your world screams and yells at you that it is crazy and it don't work. I'm talking about Christians. The world don't even believe that there's a Bible. I'm talking about Christians will scream and yell at you and say it doesn't work. Well, are you saying this Bible doesn't work? Tell me which page to tell. Well, I'm not going to tell you tear any page out, but I just think that you, there's just a lot of ways of reading this thing, and it's just you don't understand it, and it's just confusing. And I said, do you really think that's the way God wants it to be? You want him to be confusing? Do you think that's what he wants? My Bible says if you humble yourself as a little child, you'll see the kingdom of God. You've got to humble yourself as a little child when you read this. I want you guys tonight, I want two things to tell you, and then we've got to go. Tonight, I want you to read in that book, oh, tonight, tomorrow, whatever, tonight, tomorrow morning, John chapter 13, John chapter 14, John chapter 15, John chapter 16, John chapter 17, John chapter 18. And let's come and talk. That's Old Covenant. Did you know that? Jesus wasn't dead yet. And we have a better one. Better than John 13 through 18? Mm -hmm. In my brain, I go, how could it be? But it's there. It's real. It's called son. That's why he disciplines you. Because he loves you and he wants great things for you. And you can't get there because your pathway has been skewed, perverted, screwed up, wrong, wrong things, and you are the, the reason for it. Don't blame nobody else. Unless I'm mistaken, you're pretty well mature by the time you were 16. Every decision you made since you were 16, there's an age of accountability and they feel like it's about that time. It's on you. When you stand before the Lord, he's not going to say, yeah, boy, Colin, I, right, that, <laughs> I feel sorry for you, Colin, so I'm just going to forget about all those dumb decisions you made and all those stupid things because it was Mark's fault. <laughs> not going to happen. But I'm offering you a way. I don't care how much money you think you got. Because I've already shared with you that money is not for you anyways. That money is a stewardship. Stewardship is not ownership. I'm a steward of this house. I owned it since the day it was built. My name was on it. 
But I don't see it as mine. I see it as what can I do with it that enhances the kingdom of God. It's a material thing that God has trusted me with. And what am I doing with it? What kind of stewardship can I offer him so that I can have more? And he's given me a lot more. A lot more. But if you think it's because Steve Doyle is really an intellectual, you know what I graduated from college with? I was below 2.0 my last quarter of my senior year. Below. You know what I took? I took a couple of courses. One of them was a music class. Voice. Five hours. <laughs> you guys want to hear me sing? Come on, Joey. Now, come on. Don't be, don't be, don't be, don't be bad. Now. Don't be bad. I got an A in that class. And the professor told me, if I, could, if I could just have you for a year, I'll have you singing on the radio. Probably hillbilly music, you know. <laughs> that gave me 2.0. Because I didn't want to be in college two years earlier. I wanted to quit. I don't want to be in college anymore. I'm wasting my time here. I hate to go to class. I hate messing with it. I mean, I got things I want to do. I want to tear the world up. And the Lord spoke to me, even though he had no right to because I was the meanest, orneriest, dirtiest scumbag in this side of the Pecos. My mouth was full of garbage, but he kept loving me. He said, I can't deny myself. I didn't know that then, but I know it now. He loves you, man. He can't deny himself. Take advantage of it. That's sonship. And he took care of me. And he gave me a 2 -0. And you know why I stayed in college? Because I started. Is that true, Mark? Is that what you did? And that simple little thing of obedience is going to be a great, great stepping stone for this young man. It was for me. You don't quit what you're doing. You just move into something better. And there's going to be all kinds of people trying to convince you that's the dumbest thing you could ever do. I was made amazing job offers. And I turned them all down. Living at home, my dad says, that's the dumbest thing I've ever seen. Why would you do that? Son, you can't live here anymore. you got to get out. I paid room and board. I paid room and board when I was 17 years old. Because he didn't understand why am I doing that? Well, I can't live with that. Long story. So I won't go into it. Father, we praise you. We thank you. That you're teaching us how to stand and how to to stick with something and how to believe you and how to look at ourselves the way you see us. You see us through Jesus. He's the mediator between God and man. You see us the way you see Jesus. You don't see our inadequacy, our weaknesses, our struggles, our in, in, incapabilities, our lack of any uh, wealth and lack of anything. You see us the way you see your son. And we give you praise, Father. Wow. Hallelujah. Wow. We thank you. We praise you for it. Man, what a change. What a difference. To know that all those issues, Father, that we deal with and struggle with are only there to strengthen us. 
And we give you thanks and praise for it, sir, in Jesus' name. Amen.